Cool. So we're going to get started. So um, this is our second in this series of webinars. Um, we did one uh, last week that had a huge response. We had a few hundred people joining in um, and we were talking about how to, I suppose, how to figure out and start thinking about a plan um, post COVID. Uh, none of us know quite what that all looks like yet, but um, you know we've been sharing some ideas on how we can start to plan for a successful acceleration out of this when it all changes, um, you know, and, and things start to change for the better. Um, but before we get started, I'm just going to give a little bit of an introduction for those who don't know any of us here. My name is Andrew. I'm the founder at Made Brave. Made Brave is a creative brand agency. We're based uh, out of Glasgow in Scotland. Um, and we also have a content agency over in Edinburgh called Campfire. Um, we've recently been named um, one of the top 100 independent agencies in the UK from the drum. And also recently, we're very proud um, to say that Campaign Magazine mentioned us as one of best places to work. Also, um, we tend to spend our days working with uh, a number of uh, brands uh, globally. Uh, these are some of the clients that we work with. And so we have quite a wide knowledge uh, in terms of branding from um, different clients, different industries, and all different sectors. And we quite like it that way because we often take thinking from one sector or one industry, and we can adapt that into an industry that's maybe not thought about some of those, um, some of those ways of thinking. We usually spend our days in this lovely studio. This is our studio in the east end of Glasgow that we've just kitted out just before the bloody COVID arrived. Um, so we're missing it dearly. Uh, it's sitting gathering dust at the moment. Um, but you know, if you want to see a little bit more about our space, um, we've also shared some content on how we built that and our thinking behind that. Um, you can go and check that out on our website, um, just madebrave.com. And we've got a team of just under 50 people um, based in Scotland, um, you know, a whole host of strategists, uh, designers, motion graphics, um, developers, and all the you know project management, account management, and operations. And um, we've also got a little marketing managers at the bottom there. There's Astro and Harvey. Um, but today on this webinar, we're here with um, two of our brand strategists. We've got Mark Cullen, our head of strategy, and Ross, uh, who's a strategist at Made Brave. And we also have Keenan Irwin, who is our brand manager at Made Brave. So. Mark and Ross are going to be taking you through this webinar initially, but then all four of us are here for um, Q and A session at the end. Um, so I'll pass you on over to Mark. Thank you, thank you. Um, now I, I don't know how many of you watching this uh, attended the first webinar a couple of weeks ago. Um, this is very much a sequel to it, but like, like all good sequels, you don't have to have seen the original. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to run through quite quickly. The, the 10 tips that, that we had in the last webinar on how you can start to build your post-COVID relaunch strategy, uh, however you want to frame it. Um, they were 10 tips that essentially we've been thinking about really long and hard, and we're going to be advising our clients and have been advising our clients. Um, now, unlike last time, where we spent quite a lot of time on those 10 tips, this time we're going to whisk through them. Um, and the reason for that is we had some feedback from the last uh, webinar, but there were a couple of, of those tips that people found really, really interesting. And so what we've done is we've zoomed into one of them and we're going to do a deep dive into just one of those tips. And as you've seen from the title of the webinar, it's all about the unchanging and how you can build a strategy around the things that you do know rather than the things that, that you don't. And at the very end, we will round everything up uh, with a quick summary of our relaunch roadmap that we're offering just now, and then a Q&A if you have any questions. Uh, uh, first, um, this is a repeat of the previous webinar, but it's important. Um, we want to start with a big sense check here. Uh, we are not um, time travelers. We do not know any more about what's going to come over the next six months or 12 months than you do. All we are doing is we are reacting to the world and the information as we see it. Um, and no one who claims to have all the answers right now is telling you the truth. We are all reacting. Um, and that's particularly because every single brief and every single sector, as you all know, is totally different. Uh, and so there is no one strategy. There is no one silver bullet that we can we can hand over to you and go, this is what you're going to do to, to save your business or transform your business. Instead, what we're going to review today, and uh, I think this is really what a lot of these webinars are going to be like over the next few weeks, is we are going to, we are going to very much zero in on not what your business needs to do, 
because every single brief and every single business and every single sector is different. Instead, we're going to be advising you on how you can go about answering that question yourself. So this is very much a process and a way of thinking rather than necessarily you can take some notes here today and go away and you have all the answers. This is just the start of a journey. It's not the whole journey. And there was a there was a point that we mentioned in the previous webinar that we just want to mention again as well, that within business, within marketing, within all of our lives right now, we're having a bit of a debate around what we should be doing next. In March, everyone went into a crisis mode. Everyone rightly parked an awful lot of marketing and looked at their cash flow <laughs> and they looked at business survival. And, and we all did it and it was the correct thing to do. But now we're in this strange period where we're in lockdown, we're out of lockdown. We're, we're in a recession, but we're not quite in a recession yet. Um, there's some businesses that are bunkering still and they are in that frame of mind. And there are other businesses that are responding. And what we want to kind of start with and just intro is that traditionally <laughs> there is a way of approaching this. And the research of decades of recessions is very, very clear that the sooner you can accelerate out of a recession, the sooner you can invest your way through, if you can, if you have that cash, um, you know, if, if the administrators are at the door, that's a different conversation. But if you are in a position to do that and it hurts and it's difficult, do it. Because the research shows that if you bunker too deep for too long, it's harder for you to recover. Um, and as you can imagine, agencies like us, marketeers like a lot of you, have probably been making this argument now for the past few weeks. This is, this is on the tip of everybody's tongues. But there is a question around this crisis. This isn't just an economic crisis, it's a health crisis, and it, we don't yet know how long and how deep this could go. I mean, some of the stats like this on the front page of the New York Times, it does make you think that this is something totally different and that it could well be something different. And so what we don't wanna do here is be a bit blase and be a bit uh, dismissive of this crisis there is a very, very good argument to say that for a lot of businesses, the bunker is the right place for you. And so there is this natural tension. And we went through this tension on how to communicate this all the way through kind of April. We, we, we just knew it wasn't right. We knew it was too early. Um, but between these two sides, as a team, we have made our choice and, and we have kind of uh, picked aside on behalf of our clients and hopefully the clients that we're going to be looking to attract. Um, and that is that the mindset of recovery has to be has to be adopted and that recovery has to be earned. Otherwise, it is not going to happen. If you sit back and you wait for this boom that we all was, we were all talking about in March, uh, we all believed that in September and August, everything would shoot back up again. Um, I think we've all realized that it's much more complicated than that. that our philosophy is that, that marketers need to help this recovery happen. They have to start planning now. They cannot wait for the recovery to happen, otherwise it won't do it. And so it's just a shift in mindset where as marketers, um, whether you are inside a company or whether you're working for a company as an agency or as a freelancer, it's your job to be on the front foot now. You are the ones who have to be making this argument. Let the head of finance make the counter argument. That's that healthy tension. So um, we distilled that down into 10 pieces of simple advice, which we have, we have been passing on as much as we can. Uh, a very good question came up at the last webinar, which was, why are you giving all of this away for free? Um, well, our, our attitude is, it should be given away to, for free because if we aren't all economically recovering that we're never going to do it collectively anyway. Um, and again, I just want to stress, these are not definitive answers. They are broad, they are ways of thinking. And for a lot of you as well, it will be teaching a granny to suck eggs. And if that's the case, then that's a good thing. Um, and unlike the last webinar, 
Um, I'm going to take you through them just now fast. <laughs> uh, I apologize if, you, if I go a bit too quickly, but um, there'll be some instructions at the end of the webinar about how you can actually go back and watch the previous one uh, if you want to get more of the 10 tip in detail. Um, so of these 10, the first of them are all about you as a business, regardless of your circumstances, getting the bearings, your unique bearings as to where you are. So the first point is every single sector is on its own journey. If you are a travel company, you're in a very different situation if you're selling baked beans. Um, and so you have to map exactly where your individual sector is on its own COVID journey. And that also counts for where you are in the world because different countries in the world are at different stages. So try and see this as a journey and try and make it sector specific. Um, and that involves an awful lot of competitor research. It involves you taking the time to do that. Uh, and we're, we're gonna start mapping it. Um, here there's some examples on the screen of how McKinsey have started to map it too. The second one, um, and this is, I know all marketers, this is the most obvious thing in the world, but um, I hate to break it to you. It's breaking my heart. An awful lot of audience research that we have been slaving over for months or years or audience insights that we've always been able to draw on, a lot of them are out of date <laughs> and a lot of them need to be questioned and developed further. And whether that is a dedicated piece of audience research, if you can afford it, or whether it's just social listening, which is what we've been offering a lot of, you will find that drivers, that motivations, and that purchasing behavior is now very, very different for very different types of people across different sectors. And I don't know what that is. We are still learning. So you have to start asking those questions now um, and not stop asking it because it's not like, this is not like 9-11 where something happened. This is something that is still happening. And so people are going to be changing, particularly as lockdown releases. That's going to have an enormous effect on consumer behavior. Another aspect of getting your bearings is exactly what we are going to be talking about today, which is not just building on what you know, building on what you don't. So I'm going to not talk about that because Ross is going to be going a deep dive into that third one, which is what we got some interesting comments on last time. The fourth one, um, which I think we are quite tempted to do another webinar on, which you think is really interesting, is, um, is scenario planning. Um, in finance, businesses map out the best case scenario, the worst case scenario, the likely scenario, the unlikely scenario. And that is essential for cash flow management. It's essential for so many other aspects of consultancy and high value thinking. But yet when it comes to marketing, it's very rarely done, which is quite strange because it's so relevant to today. Um, and quite early on, a lot of uh, finance firms and auditing firms started doing this for their clients. I mean, the, the big four particularly were doing it. They were saying, look, we don't know what's going to happen, but here are the different scenarios. And if these second scenarios happen, you have to have a strategic plan ready for that. So if you are starting to think about your marketing and brand strategy and you haven't done scenario planning, I mean, why, I think the way that we're thinking of doing it is best, worst, and most likely, um, that we're suggesting is a really, really important basis of your strategic plan going forward. So I think we're gonna be doing a deeper dive into scenario planning over the next few weeks. The next few on our top 10 are all about then saying, okay, you've done your um, absorption of, of the status quo and you've got your, your bearing on the evolving context. The next thing is finding exactly what you need to do next and identifying a focus point. Remember, the most important, most important thing in strategy is choosing what not to do, not just choosing what to do. You need a focus. And so the buzzword, which everybody's talking about just now, it's, it's, it's like LinkedIn bingo right now, is um, innovation and pivoting. Everyone's talking about pivoting. Um, and there was a period early on where distilleries were making hand gel, which was great, but we're at a point now where that pivot is becoming more medium to long term. Companies are realizing that as this, as this changing and evolving world, at least in 2020, is happening, they have to be offering something different. But there's some counter thinking 
which is very, very valuable, which says be very careful what you pivot into. Because if you pivot too far from your core purpose and your core um, and your core uh, kind of value proposition in the minds of your primary audiences, you will detract from what it is people understand of you and you will ultimately break that connection with customers. People will basically look at you and go, what the hell are you doing? Uh, you don't have any right being in that sector. And in the last webinar, we had a few examples of companies that are already starting to do that. And there are examples of that looking back to the 1990s of companies who responded to the, 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 the dot-com boom and the growth of the internet with products and services which had no bearing or relevance to what it is they did. And there is a theory that that is why that fueled the dot-com bubble as well. Um, so pivot, yes. Innovate, yes. But innovate and pivot around what it is you're actually good at and what it is that people understand you already do. A really, really uh, obvious one, but I think is, this is probably my favorite of the 10, um, is in your innovation, in your uh, trying to change the way you or your clients are approaching this challenge, don't just obsess on trying to come up with an idea that no one's ever come up with before. Um, being unique is the enemy of often some very, very good ideas. Just be better. A good example of that is um, Zoom fundamentally are not offering it. We're not offering anything that Skype didn't or the Google Hangouts didn't or that all these other things didn't. What they did was they refined around the edges and offered it slightly better. Or in the case of the classic marketing example, Apple, Apple were not the first with many of their products. They just marketed them, they branded them, and they executed them better. So in your brainstorming, focus on that being better rather than necessarily being unique. Otherwise, you will chase a madcap invention that you might not be able to deliver or fulfill. And the final aspect of focus is around the message itself. Now, a lot of us are marketers, a lot of us are designers, copywriters. This is where our brains go straight to. We love What's the campaign message? What's the big idea? What's the theme of, of, of the moment? And, um, <laughs> and there's an awful lot of inevitable, heartfelt herding, which has gone on, um, where people are trying to offer a relevant, relevant message to the, to, to the crisis. And as a result, everything started to sound the same. Around about the same time in April, mid-April, everyone started saying the same kind of stuff. And it was all heartfelt. But, you know, we're now at a point where as well as being relevant to COVID-19, you've got to offer something which is distinct to you. And I think the, the kind of overriding message of that and a nice kind of example of that is we've got up on the screen there, the, 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 the Budweiser WhatsApp, 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 WhatsApp um, kind of spin on their campaign, totally ownable to them. Or another example, which is gloriously cheesy, but, but actually it's, it's very good and effective. BT did a series of, um, of cutting ads to local news, basically with celebrities telling people how to communicate more effectively. That was a great pivot from their purpose, connecting people. It was totally relevant. It's all about COVID-19, but it was different. No one else was doing it and no one else could do it with the authority that BT could do it. And another, Great example of not only being relevant, but being distinct to you is the work that Durex um, released, although quite how broad a release this is. You know, there's not much outdoor advertising going on right now for obvious reasons. But um, this kind of campaign around um, around the new normal of, of sex um, was totally ownable to them. Nobody else could say that. So a broad lesson in that message in, in how we're all going to be approaching creative briefs over the next six months is if you're saying a message and you cover up the logo and anyone else can say it, it's probably not the most distinct message for you. So finally, um, on, our, our, on our super fast top 10 um, is how you then execute that and execute it in the right way because it is not about chucking tons of money. Uh, at problems. Timing is so key. Um, you know, in March, as this crisis was happening, we were internally at May Bray thinking, right, how can we respond? How can we offer new services to clients? But very quickly, we realized it was too soon. We, we were chasing our tail as everybody else was. We were responding uh, uh, in a way that, that wasn't really, wasn't right for that moment. Now for you, 
based on individual sectors, you will have to make those judgments. You can do the strategy because strategy stays indoors. But in terms of how you execute that, if you go too fast, you could be talking to an empty room. If you go too slow, you will miss that boat and you will potentially miss that recovery point that we also desperately need. So it's about your sector, it's about where you are in the world, your location, and it's about your circumstances as a business. You also need to make a cash flow judgment as well, is that there's a point in the year where you will need to do something in order to mitigate a, a, a problem in the future. Something which is, um, I think, obvious to some businesses, but not obvious to others, uh, and it's, I think it's very relevant for an awful lot of marketeers um, who see themselves as designers with their head down, don't necessarily see themselves as engagers within other parts of companies, is you have to take the entire company with you, not just the marketing department. And if you are sitting in a marketing department just now, your strategy shouldn't be a marketing strategy or even a brand strategy. It needs to be a business strategy. And the example we used um, a couple of weeks ago was Akaido who um, Waitrose were naturally scaling themselves up for this crisis um, and expecting a quite a large surge and were probably going to hold up John Lewis in the process. But Akaido was not geared up in tandem, certainly not geared up to the level that Sainsbury's, Tesco and Amazon were. And as a result, there was a fulfillment problem, which frustrated people and people moved elsewhere. So in this strategy, don't see it as a brand strategy. See it as a business strategy to bring everybody along with you. And finally, um, it's one of the great cliches of modern marketing, but boy, <clears throat> it is relevant to now. You have to respond and adapt in small incremental bets, not betting big. Most of you, unless you are very, very lucky as a company, are looking at your balance sheets, you're looking at your cash flows, and you're looking at your revenues, and you're asking serious questions of yourself as a company. This ain't the moment for an awful lot of you to be buying Super Bowl ads. This is a moment for you to be testing carefully exactly the right message in exactly the right way with exactly the right people and exactly the right mediums and then understanding what is working and what isn't. Because, and I, it's certainly the case when I open my, my Twitter right now, everybody seems to be an expert on everything. But in reality, no one knows anything right now. Uh, and I'm saying that as a brand strategist, uh, we are all responding to circumstances. So the only option you have is to bet small, is to learn as you go, build up that knowledge base on what is working with your audience, and then time it right and get that timing right. So these are our sort of 10 broad ideas for how we are going to be um, engaging with our clients and talking to people and also trying to prompt more activity in the in the broader sector to get everybody off the bench and get everybody investing again as much as, we, as much as they can. As you can see, it's not what you need to do, it's how you need to do it. Um, we presented all of this a few weeks ago and had really good feedback, but there was one um, topic which people found really interesting, and that's what we're going to zoom into today. Uh, and it's at that point where I will uh, I will hand over the reins to Ross, who works uh, with me in our strategy team. Cool, thanks, Mark. Um, can someone give me a heads there up? There we go. I've switched over your slide, Ross. Perfect. Okay, crack on. Yeah. So as Mark said, our focus is on don't just ask what has changed, ask what hasn't. Um, the reason for this is because well, I think it's sort of human nature that um, in a time like this, everyone sort of does focus on what is changing. It's sort of inbuilt into us that we have this reaction to our environment. And you, as Mark said, you sort of see it all the, all the time right now. Every thought piece, every newsletter that you get, every piece of research that comes into your inbox is about um, what's going to change and how much is going to change and how quickly it's going to change. Just a couple of sort of screenshots there from the likes of YouGov, um, the Atlantic, talking about really big sort of wide scale changes that this pandemic will cause. Um, and I think probably the biggest caveat about what I'm going to say is we're absolutely not disputing the fact that things are going to change or that things have changed. Um, I think it's more about where your focus should be or um, sort of how, how you go about weighing up um, that sort of information. Um, as I said, we're sort of naturally predisposed towards um, looking at things that change that are different in our environment. That's that's sort of evolutionary, evolutionarily built into us. 
Um, I think the sort of best example I've seen of that uh, is a, a psychologist who has this theory that the reason that water doesn't taste of anything um, is because our taste buds have sort of calibrated it out so we can more easily notice contaminants and, and pollutants. Um, and that's been very good for us as, as humans that um, we'll get a lot of information coming in and we have to be able to spot the things that are different and therefore potential threats in our environment. But the problem is it means when things are, are changing in quite a big way like this, maybe you've got sort of 10, 20, 30 percent of your overall life or the overall economy um, is severely impacted in the short and medium term. Um, our brains trick us into thinking that it feels more like 60, 70 or 80 percent of things are changing. We think everything is changing, whereas a lot of things continue to stay the same. Um, we got a comment. Uh, from Nick Murray, just as, as Mark was talking about the, um, the pivoting thing, saying a lot of this is just frank common sense, but so many people have pivoted right off the bed. So thanks, Mark. <laughs> thanks, Nick, for that. That was a really good comment. But I think it demonstrates it um, sort of really well that even though a lot of what we're saying is common sense, as humans, we're quite easily susceptible to these biases that cause uh, them to ignore us. Uh, so that's sort of the reason we're, we're highlighting it. And I think you are seeing brands sort of overreacting to this because there's this there's a pressure to change with the changing environment and a pressure to be seen to be changing. I spotted this example on um, on LinkedIn of uh, Just Eat talking about um, I think a problem that we can all relate to that uh, as their employees move to home working, um, they found they're on a lot more calls, a lot more catch ups, um, and they just couldn't get that break from their their screen. Um, so they, they institu instituted this Just Eat Power Hour so that people could have an hour out of their day just to spend time with their families, have some food, go for a walk. Um, and someone rather sort of dryly um, picked it up on, on Twitter and said, well done, you've just invented the lunch break. Um, <laughs> I don't really mean to dump on Just Eat here because I think what they're picking up on an issue that, as I said, is something that we can all relate to. Um, when we're working for home, from home in, in the sort of jobs that we do. Um, but it is sort of symptomatic of our, our human tendency to overreact uh, to this sort of thing. Um, uh, Tom Goodwin's picked that up a, a bit as well. Um, the likes of MS saying shopping may never be the thing again. Uh, but if anything, you could argue that, that shopping is, is the one thing that, that we'll probably say the most similar in, in the short term and has changed the least. Obviously, we've got social distancing measures in place and uh, there's queues outside supermarkets now. Um, lots of tape on the floor. But apart from that, what has really changed about your shopping experience? Um, so there's a lot, a big part of the economy that, that is not changing at all. Um, and a quote that we shared in the last webinar on this point is from Jeff Bezos. And he said long before this um, started, uh, ironically, a crisis that has um, propelled him towards becoming the world's first trillionaire, apparently. But he said, I very frequently get the question, what's going to change in the next 10 years? I almost never get the question, what's not going to change? He goes on to say in, uh, uh, in that quote that um, that's the important part that you can build a business on is the things that are not going to change. Because I think uh, what none of us want and what none of our clients want is to be in a position where we've successfully pivoted our way into surviving a crisis only to get ourselves in trouble 18 months down the line because the, the new service that we're offering just doesn't last. Um, I don't know, the, the sort of stereotypical example might be if you started up a toilet paper uh, company right now, because that's not really going to change in the long run. Um, Byron Sharp, I saw, was, was quoted as saying recently as well, um, brands aren't built overnight, so they won't disappear overnight either, which I thought is quite a reassuring notion to us as um, as communicators and marketers as well. Um, another one of my sort of personal marketing heroes, Bill Burnback, has quite a, a similar take on it. He says it's fashionable to talk about a changing man, but a communicator must be concerned with the unchanging man, with this obsessive drive to survive, to be admired, to succeed, to love, to take care of his own. So although technology changes, the world changes all the time, the way we as humans react to that and probably more crucially, the way we have to communicate to them about it is always going to be around these same sort of innate traits. Um, and yeah, we can talk about Zoom as much as we like in comms, but we have to we have to do that in a way that's sort of consistently human and unchanging. 
Um, but there's probably another couple of reasons that sort of link back to what Mark was saying around why we think you should focus on the unchanging. Uh, the first thing to say is, for starters, where the best data is. Um, everyone is trying to predict the future right now. Um, Mark said a lot about how that is going to be quite difficult. And um, I'd certainly skip, uh, share his skepticism of, of anyone who, um, who quite sort of strongly puts forward a view on what things are going to look like in the next couple of years, because it's really, really difficult to predict that. Um, there's been some great work, um, if you've heard of it, done by Philip Tetlock, um, who's sort of this godfather of forecasting research. Um, he's been doing uh, research with his, his partner, his uh, research partner and wife for about 20 years on, on forecasting. Um, and he's got structured tournaments set up where people make predictions um, and he's analyzed over 28,000 predictions about the, the future um, through those. What he's found is that forecasters are only slightly more accurate than chance um, and actually usually worse than sort of basic extrapolation algorithms especially on sort of longer range forecasts of three to five years. Um, and interestingly, um, you find that the, the more famous um, forecasters, people who sort of did this for a job, who went on um, went on to CNN or Fox or um, BBC and, and, and made forecasts about the future, they tended to actually do worse than chance, um, which is quite an interesting little psychological uh, quirk. Um, as a bit of an aside, uh, for anyone who is interested in how to make better predictions, he does have some learnings out of that, which are um, gather evidence from a variety of sources, think probabilistically, um, working in teams, keeping score, and being willing to admit error and change course quite quickly. So big proclamations that you, you stick to, regardless of the data that comes in, tend not to serve you well, even though the sort of media would have us believe that, that that's what the best forecasters do. Um, the second point is that most of the time, recessions don't really typically change behavior in the long run. Um, absolutely, yes, we are seeing quite substantial and stark short-term effects of, of this recession. Um, everyone is reporting about that, and, and there's, there's, no, there's no doubt of it. And um, increasingly, there does seem to be a feeling that, that this will not be the, the V-shaped recession that, that has been talked about by some, where we immediately bounce back as soon as lockdown is un, undone. But most of the time, recessions don't really typically change behavior in the long run. Mark Ritson has, has uh, sort of talked to that effect quite recently as well, saying that um, it's really behavior that leads things. And a lot of the changes have been caused by legislation, by us being forced by governments, quite rightly, to stay indoors, to not go out. Um, and if there is going to be a, a change in the long run, it will be behaviorally led as those bans are lifted. Um, the economists have, have sort of co coined this idea of the 90% economy quite recently, um, and they're talking about uh, this fact that as we come out of this, there are there is going to be 10% of the economy that is not going to go back to normal, mostly around sort of things where you have to socially distance for, we're, we're not going to have as much um, socializing in public, things like bowling, bars, um, generally the sort of ledger economy um, will, will take a hit in, in the medium term. But that still leaves 90% of the economy uh, left. Um, and a good quote from their article was, first of all, they sort of pointed out that on one level, still having 90% of the economy available to access at, at this sort of time is quite an astonishing achievement. And had this struck a couple of years ago or a couple of decades ago, only a tiny minority of people would have been able to sort of keep working and keep buying um, in a large, large part, uh, thanks to the internet. Um, but they went on to say that frac the fraction of life that is missing will color people's experiences and behaviors in ways that will not be offset by the happy fact that most of what ma matters is still available and ticking over. And I guess that just sort of nods towards that, that idea of bias that um, I was talking about earlier, that as humans, we are, we are gonna focus on um, that stark change and, and, and we're, it's gonna make us feel uh, sad or anxious or, or annoyed at it. But that does give us an opportunity as communicators to say a lot of, in reality, a lot of what we do in the economy is still going on if we can switch the conversation in, uh, to focus on that instead, then we can 
uh, we can not only sort of get commercial uh, outcome for our clients, but we can we can probably up the mood of of the nation at a time when it when it needs it. And I don't think that's that's too big a claim for us to make. Um, so what is unchanging? I think a large part um, this is still this is still becoming clear, and, and everyone will have uh, their own opinions on it. But we had a little bit of a think about it. Um, internally and, and one thing that helped us was sort of structuring how we identified the things that were changing and we came up with this little grid here where on one axis you've got things that are scheduled versus things that are unscheduled and on the other um the horizontal axis you've got um the sort of things that we're doing the same amount as before and then the other side of things that we can still do but we can't do other things so we're doing more of the things that we can still do and um, we've sort of labeled them as seasonal and calendar events, um, this idea of life going on in the bottom left-hand corner, um, COVID, uh, COVID coping mechanisms, those sort of things we're doing day-to-day -day, um, in our, our new normal, and then uh, bigger, more sort of future thinking, new normal plans for when things start to go back uh, to normal. Um, the sort of examples that we came up with, uh, the, the obvious things like Father's Day, Christmas, Thanksgiving, of course, there's still a bit of a question mark on how much these things will be impacted, how much will have come out of lockdown, but for the time being we can assume they will be relatively unchanged from usual. Um, and all those, every sort of national X day that you have, whether that's National Allotments Week, which by the way is the 12th of August, um, if you're interested, um, I think the best examples we find of that were the, the Wallace and Gromit Wrong Trousers Day on the 19th of June or Sourdough September, if, you're, uh, if you've taken up baking a bit more recently. Um, there's also that sort of life goes on thing. Appliances will still break. Children will grow. Will still grow up. It's still going to rain. It's still going to be more sunny. We know all these things. It may sound a bit flippant, but uh, these things drive consumption. Mm -hmm. uh, you're not really going to buy ice cream when it's uh, when it's rainy. Um, birthdays, people still need to, to gift uh, to each other. And actually, in that sort of COVID coping mechanisms quadrant, I think anecdotally, at least, um, we've seen some examples of of people sending gifts just for, for no other reason than to cheer people up, which has been quite a nice response to it. Within that, you've, you've also got all the sort of home cooking, the rise of online gaming, people buying in bulk and things like that. And then as we start to come out of this, um, particularly as a result of um, less, uh, less people planning and, and being able to spend on overseas holidays, there's probably a bit more money going around for staycations, for home renovations, People are taking up new hobbies. If they haven't already, they might be planning to. And then, of course, there's uh, the sort of increasing move that we've seen from a lot of companies towards uh, an increased home working, even when we do go back to normal. Um, the one sort of caveat that I want to end on with this is, of course, some things are changing. Um, and there's a bit of evidence that uh, to sort of counter that recessions point, it, that this might actually be a bit of a bigger change. Um, and a bigger impact in the long run um, on behavior. Um, I took this pretty wholesale from a great webinar I saw recently from um, the marketing consultancy Genius Steals um, on work. Definitely encourage you to watch that, that webinar if, if you can get it. Um, I, I don't feel bad stealing their slides because their entire philosophy is, is the idea of uh, Genius Steals. Um, but they have this idea that uh, they've linked back to a piece of art it came out of China uh, called Waste Not, which in which the artist um, they, they they took a model of their their mother's home, which you, you can see in that image there. It's quite small. That that was the square footage of their their house, and then they laid out everything that um, their mom had fit into that house in there, just to show how much she had kept and hoarded and refused to waste. Um, and their point was that this came out of. Um, this behavior was formed by a sort of sustained period of um, cultural revolution, social turmoil, and, and really sort of a lack of being able to access uh, goods and services, which sort of formed this behavior to, to hoard in, in the long term. Um, and I think their point was that the longer this goes on, the, the more likely we are to get a sort of emotional and behavioral um, switch. And it's sort of off this idea of um, a bit of personal trauma if we are personally traumatized enough by this experience then that will change behavior um, and i think at the moment we, we don't really know 
whether that's going to happen or not, but it's definitely something to keep an eye on. Um, they went on to sort of talk about the fact that we have seen this with pandemics before, um, and actually the sort of stages they mapped out, I don't know where they got this from, so I'm taking the word for it, but they're smart people, um, was that it sort of lines up to the, the stages of grief, and we are grieving for our former life. But I think it's, it's an interesting point that... Um, we don't really know what the knock-on effects are going to be for behaviour, and we have to keep monitoring these. We're still, we're now sort of past the initial first burst of this, and we're starting to understand more about how it's affecting behaviour. But we're still only three months in. If you look at sort of big previous recessions, previous um, sort of world events that have impacted things, um, the likes of 9/11, airspace was closed for two days uh, around the world after that. Um, but it took nine seven months i think for um air traffic to return to the normal to the levels it was before that um and now we're, as in stark contrast that was just two days and now we're seeing sort of air traffic dropping uh, to i think something like a thousandth of of what it what it was before this um so we don't know if that will bounce back immediately um and we have to keep monitoring these things as as we go along um, so I think on that point, just the, the final thing to say is keep interrogating. Um, for me, as, as sort of Mark nodded to, this is not about saying we know what the answer is, but it's also not about saying we can't. That means we can't do anything. There is there there's signals out there. There's pieces of information that we can build from, um, and that information will continue to come in as we move through this. And all we can do is continue to look out for that and continue to, uh, in the spirit of Philip. Tetlock sort of readjust our predictions and our scenario planning as we go. So be prepared for the things you thought would change to stay the same. Be prepared for the things that you thought would stay the same to change. Um, and sort of remember the first tip, which is figure out where you sit, where your business and where your sector sits uh, in terms of the effects as we go forward into the short, medium and long term of this and continue to update that. Um, yeah, and that's sort of me. So I'm going to hand back to Mark now. Thanks. Um, hang on a sec. Are you, do can you guys? You want your slides back, Mark? You just need to share your screen again. Apologies there. Thanks, Ross. No, I think um, I think the I think the the that there is no harm in the question of saying we don't know. <laughs> and I think it's something which uh, culturally uh, as kind of, even within business, it's kind of an instinct that if someone asks you a question, you want to have an answer to it. And it is, it is like that, uh, that, that, that social media thing of everyone being an expert all the time on everything, apart from the fact they don't know anything. Um, and so, what I think hopefully this has done is it's it's demonstrated again, uh, it's not about finding the answers right now, but it's about making sure you're asking the questions and and starting to map that strategy out. Because um, it's quite easy to take a kind of a cynical view um, of, of, the, of what we're doing. Um, but at the same time, just shared on our Slack channels this morning and yesterday was the campaign that Nike are uh, just rolling out across the world. Typical for Nike, an absolutely incredible campaign, really emotional, um, all about getting off the bench, a campaign which, as we said earlier, is distinct and relevant to them. Well, that type of campaign doesn't come out of nowhere. It comes because a few weeks ago, they will have war roomed it. They will have started a response strategy. Now, granted, that's one of the largest consumer brands in the world, but that scales, that same mentality of everything we've gone through today scales all the way down, regardless of your business size, B2C, B2B. Um, so it's about being proactive and making those choices at the right point. So we have a, a product uh, and uh, a kind of a process that we've developed, um, which takes in everything that we've talked about and, um, and puts it into what we've called a relaunch roadmap. And the idea of it is it is 100% tailored to who you are, what industry you work in, and the types of people that you need to sell to. Um, it's rather than it being a one-size-fits-all approach, 
It's instead figuring out exactly what size you need. Um, and a key part of it is stakeholder management and making sure all the right people are in the right place. That's we're noticing particularly important now in the furlough age, where um, within the cultures of inside businesses, uh, businesses aren't functioning in the way they would have done normally. So you have to build those connections within businesses in order to have a business-wide response. It provides you with a creative platform so you kind of can figure out that distinct message uh, uh, regardless of when it is you feel you need to launch it. And it's the type of uh, framework which it scales regardless of the size of your business. So if you're a global conglomerate, this, this framework will work for you. But equally, it's also pretty well suited to SMEs and medium-sized businesses as well, um, because it's often those businesses whose marketing teams have been particularly ravaged by furlough. And as a result, those marketing teams um, or sales teams, they need the extra support of an agency to come in and help them, uh, as opposed to having their team there as before. So the, the roadmap breaks down into three stages. Um, and uh, the first of those is echoing what we've been talking through just now, analysis and figuring out what we need to figure out about, about you or about the company. Um, and that forms itself as a report, um, uh, which is an assessment of the landscape in the sector, asking those questions that Ross has just gone through in terms of what changed and what, what hasn't changed. It will include, depending on the budget, uh, an aspect of audience research and understanding what perceptions have changed um, and what perceptions and drivers and behaviors are likely to change over the next few months. It, it's not really about what's happened in March. It's now about what happens in September and trying to map that as we're all trying to respond to the evolving lockdowns and situation. Um, and then an aspect of that is scenario planning, um, as we've talked through earlier. Um, trying to figure out what those scenarios look like for you, um, given individual business circumstances. So if you are a business who is right on the edge of survival right now, your, wor your worst case scenario is very, very different to most other businesses. So it'll be mapping that out. The next stage of that is, is collaborative. Um, we are, most of the time, as a lot of you know who work in strategy, we don't solve your problems for you. You end up solving them. We are just the ones who, who kind of spot the right answers and we can put that into the right framework for you. So we run a, a strategy workshop, um, a full day remotely, obviously, uh, where we identify the priorities and the objectives that we need to, to, to fit into. And we take all of that analysis point, we work it together with you, we get the right people in the right room, and, uh, and as a result, we form the, 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 the kind of outline strategic plan, whether that is a nine-month plan, a 12-month plan, depends on your business. And then we produce the kind of the second strategic report, which is your relaunch strategy. Now, an aspect of that is messaging. It will include a likely a refined uh, value proposition that can either be temporary or permanent, which will include analysis of the right tone and making sure that you're a part of that kind of COVID solution, which businesses need to see themselves as rather than purely being commercially driven. Um, it will have advice from our marketing team and May Brave on timing and on media planning as well to making sure it's right for you and right for your budget. Um, and an aspect of that will be about uh, failing, but failing fast, which is about quick, responsive, wins a lot of that will naturally be in ux but there'll be many many uh, many other aspects of how we will try and utilize a budget to ensure that it responds quickly and we learn as fast as we can so that we can then we, we know when we can bet big if it's right for you so this relaunch roadmap is essentially a, a framework regardless of your business for how you can approach the next few months a lot of businesses are already doing this. A lot of businesses are doing aspects of this, but a lot of them aren't. A lot of them are still in the bunker. And a lot our, our overriding message through these webinars is regardless of who you are, unless you really are at administrators or at the door uh, stage, you have to start thinking about making this recovery happen. And a lot of that starts with questions like these. So, um, at that point, uh, I'll pass over to Keenan to talk about uh, what some of the next steps are. And then finally, we'll take some questions. Cool. Uh, thanks, Mark. Um, and thanks to Ross. Uh, thanks to both of you for going through those. Um, you know, as we said at the start last week, 
uh, we, we kind of, we spent all of our time going through those, those 10 tips, um, it was a little bit more detailed. Um, and so were the slides that we went through, uh, whereas today they were a bit more high level. Um, if you want to check out those slides, um, all you need to do is go to madebrave.com slash relaunch dash roadmap. Um, and I'll put a link or I put a link here in the comments, um, just here on LinkedIn. Uh, that's posted now. So if you refresh, uh, you should see it. There's a link there for you. Uh, so if you go to that page, uh, there's there's quite a bit of info uh, about the service. There's a video with Andrew explaining what it is, how we can support, who it's for, all that kind of stuff. Uh, if you scroll all the way to the bottom, there's a button there that takes you to a form. It's five quick questions. Um, and then once you've filled out the form, then there's, there's a download link uh, on the thank you page. Uh, so that you can get those. So, um, yeah, that's about it. Will we uh, will we jump into the Q and A? If you guys haven't put your questions in yet, um, if you just put them there in the comments, um, we'll start combing through them uh, and start answering them. Sure. Uh, so there's a comment from David Reed here. David's asking, what are the positive steps we can take in external and internal branding to embrace the positive behaviors from the pandemic and embed them? Oof. Good question. Good start, yeah. um, I think it, uh, Mark, you, you kill for me to start on this one. Go ahead, yeah. yeah um, I, I think it, it depends a little bit on whether you're talking about um, behaviors for consumers or, or behaviors for sort of staff um, because they're probably slightly different although both are still people so I think yeah going back to my sort of main theme I was bashing through through all of that is that yeah people react in the same way um, my experience with sort of behavior change campaigns is that you've got to be quite focused with them and quite uh, they're quite difficult to do um, especially if people don't want to do them um, but if I think probably the best way to do that is just to sort of, um, if it's really important to you to change that behavior, then pick one and focus on it. And ideally pick one that, that people have already started to move to, to sort of move with how things are moving and try to reinforce them rather than saying, this is a bad piece of behavior, um, which I think is pretty much what you're saying. Um, and again, quite common sense. Uh, but yeah, just from experience, it, it's, it's very difficult to change the behavior of people with just simple marketing when they don't want to change it. Yeah, and the only thing I, 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 I think Ross is right, the only thing I would add to that is um, if, if your question, David, is about embedding those positive changes, um, I think one of the big questions for companies, not just in the crisis, but this summer particularly, is around how to effectively communicate as a business, not just on the day-to-day -day and emails and chat groups. and It's about how to communicate and reward and to engage with your employees in a really personal way, which is, is, is the challenge to, to do it through a screen is very different to do it face-to-face. -face. And if you are managing your team face-to-face, -face, you can look someone in the eye and you can see how hard they're working and you can reward that and you can see those positive behaviors that you've asked about. And one of the challenges I think for businesses in internal branding and internal comms is how to create that connection with staff culturally remotely um, and how to do that in an effective way um, i don't have an immediate answer for that and i think that's a very very interesting question because you do want to reward the positives and retain them going forward so that's a really interesting question okay so we've got another question come in from nick murray so nick's asking what would you say to businesses who have offered discounted or pro bono services as a sympathetic response about looking to charge again um, everything is free at the moment, but feels like normal business is resuming, um, and and we should be take uh, sorry talking about charging properly. If you've not devalued uh, your offering too much, mm -hmm. that's an interesting one. Um, I think it totally depends on where you are <laughs> again, where you are on your journey, and what your individual cash flow situation and revenue situation is like. So for a lot of businesses, they will see this as an opportunity to do proactive, to do free work because 
utilizing furlough, it's the better use of their talent um, to be using uh, people in the right way. Um, in terms of how you switch that back on again, my gut, and I, I'd be interested to know if, you know, Andrew or Ian disagrees, my gut is always business survival, not necessarily business value. You can, you can make a business more premium later on down the line. You can dial up your product price later on down the line, but you have to survive as a business. Once you go under, you're under. That's it. It's very hard to restart. So if that requires you lowering your prices and going to a different business model where it's stack them high um, and sell them low, then that's totally understandable. Um, free, that's a different question. I don't know about free um, unless you're working with really paying clients. So that's my gut is businesses have got to do what they've got to do and that you can then address the value later on. And the, sorry, the last point of this is value and what you charge for things isn't just defined by you. It's defined by what people are willing to pay. And if the economy is crashing, then you know the inflation may not be affecting the value of the pounds or the dollar, literally, but there is a marketing inflation where people will just stop spending. And we've noticed it, that people freeze because they're scared. And as a result, what you may have been charging X for nine months ago, you'll now have to charge Y. That's the marketplace. So there's an aspect of you also charging what your audience will pay for it. So there's an interesting thing there as well. Yeah, so yeah so and I'll maybe jump in as well. Oh, oh sorry, Ross. Uh, yeah, I'll make it really quick. Um, just I saw something recently. Uh, it was interesting. It was an analysis uh, that someone did, uh, Julian Cole did on the last recession in 2007, and he sort of pulled out four themes, and one of them was around value. You, you, you've said sort of uh, around that yourself, but it was the idea that. Uh, in the last recession, it wasn't that people were looking for lower price. They were looking for better value for their money. Um, and, yeah, I guess as communicators, we know that um, value can be sort of created without just in terms of how you communicate it. So I think keeping that as, as the focus of your communications, whether or not you add anything to your, your offering as a business as well, can obviously help help that. But, but just focusing on that as the communication can be a way to do that yeah and, and i think just to sort of add in a sort of final point on this question is that you know i think it was you know everyone started offering pro bono um or you know free services because it was the right thing to do um you know i think you know businesses that that they were able to do so um you know it was it, it was the right thing to do and so there's a there's a natural end to that however i think hopefully what we've all learned is that you know if we are in a position of power to do so and we can help well we should continue that but i think you know people also understand now that you know at, the, at that beginning point no one knew how long this would go on for and, and we're seeing that it's going on for a continued period of time and you know the best relationships in business are, are built on relationships so i think if you're talking to your customers it's being upfront and honest with them it's being transparent and it's you know, talking about your situation, um, you know, the best relationships I have are when I can have that relationship with clients and I can tell them, you know, you know, you know, this is what we need right now, or this is where we can support you. And I think, you know, your clients will, um, you know, will be with you forever if you're, if you're, if, if you're helping them right now when you're in a position to do so. Uh, and likewise, um, you know, if you have that upfront and open conversation and they're in a position to help you, again, you know, you're going to give buckets loads of loyalty back to them um, and it put back when you're in a position to do so. So I don't, 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 don't worry about if you're having to change your strategy now and, you know, you can no longer do this. I think, you know, that, that's a natural response. And, and, and like Mark says, you know, businesses need to survive. If you don't have cash, you don't have any air and, and, and you won't be there. So, um, you know, I think, you know, the, 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 the world and, and businesses in my eyes tend to, the ones that you know, sort of uh, lead the way are the ones that, that tell the truthful story, um, you know, because otherwise people, people pick through um, things that aren't authentic and aren't real. Do we have any other questions? If, don't be scared if you've got something rustling around in your, in your head. Uh, feel free to drop it into the comments. If not, then... It maybe seems like everyone has fallen asleep. <laughs> <laughs> or potentially we've come to a natural end. Um, so, yeah, well, I just want to say thanks to everyone for taking your time out um, and joining us here uh, for this last 
hour. Um, we're planning to do a lot more of these. So if you don't already, make sure and give my profile a follow. Um, we have tried to get the Made Brave page itself um, activated for LinkedIn Live. However, we've not been successful with that. So if you make sure you follow me, but do follow the Made Brave channels as well, we will be, um, I suppose, posting any um, updates on when we will be doing these sessions. And we'll just be coming in sometimes just to surprise you. So we'll just be popping up every now and then as well. So um, make sure and follow along. Um, as Keenan mentioned earlier, he's popped a comment in the um, in this post uh, down below. So if you want to head to madebrave.com forward slash relaunch hyphen roadmap, you can then pick up the slides, the 10 top tips that we've given um, and uh, that can help you to create a little bit of a framework for your own business. Um, or if you're interested in talking to us and having us support, um, you know, obviously reach out to myself or reach out to any of these guys here. Um, there's also a form on the site, you know, if you want to chat as well. Um, but thanks so much. Really appreciate you all taking this time to hang out with us for lunch i'm now going to go and grab some lunch uh, i should really have thought about that we should bring brought lunch along here as well so um yeah thanks for joining us and we'll see you all soon take care